I remember like walking around Mount Washington, just like sneezing, trying to figure out what the hell was happening with this song. <laughs> and um, the lyrics are pretty weird, because I had a cold. <laughs> Hi, we're the Wombats, and we're here with NME doing our track by track for our new album, Fix Yourself, Not the World. Yes, so the opening track is Flip Me Upside Down. Um, and I have no idea when I wrote it, but it was sometime, <laughs> it was sometime in the past. And um, yeah, I think I'd probably had a lot of caffeine that morning and um, it's very frenetic and extremely fast and um, just like a really fun song that we thought should open our fifth album. Yeah, this car drives all by itself. Um, I had this kind of idea in my head. Um, someone said to me once, like, um, we row, but the universe steers. And I really liked it and kind of resonated with me. And I thought it would um, be the good basis for a song, but I didn't think that as a title was very good. So I was kind of searching for a different way to say that. And I was out walking um, my dogs in, um, Mount Washington and um, I looked behind me and there was this kind of Prius and as I glanced I couldn't see anyone driving it so I was like oh this car drives all by itself. It was just kind of one of those quite um, special songs that I don't know it was very um, I was just a passenger involved in it um, it just kind of seemed to happen and come together um, very well. I was thinking of um, Star Guitar by the Chemical Brothers and that kind of you know, solid, you know, straight kind of guitar part. And I've always kind of loved that track and tried to borrow a bit from that song, I guess. Um, and, but then like musically, the song itself is is pretty insane. There's lots of things happening and um, just so many random synth sounds. Um, yeah. And if you ever leave, I'm coming If You Ever Leave, I'm Coming With You was a song title I had in my phone for years, which I was trying to crank into our fourth album, but couldn't really figure out a way. And yeah, it was just something that my wife said to me a long time ago. And it's a strange song, actually. I'm not entirely sure it kind of fits in with the other 10. Um, it's kind of very poppy and um, weekendy, I guess. Um, but yeah, similar to this car. Um, felt more like a conduit than a composer and um, I think it's good when that happens. Ready for the High was one of the um, first songs we did a couple of years ago when we all met up in LA um, in Murph's studio that he has attached to his house and um, there was um, a little acoustic guitar sat there and I started playing this riff and I was like, oh, what's that? Um, I was like, I don't know, just messing around. And he went, oh, that's a good starting point. And so Todd went on the laptop and we started just messing around with, because there was no drum kit there. So we started, uh, I did some air drumming, I think, and said something like that. And um, Todd started programming it. And then Murph was there hearing stuff and started like, it was, again, I don't really know exactly what happened after that, but by the end of the day, we sort of had this song that um, we tried to, like, it goes from a straight feel into a swung feel in the chorus. And I feel like on this album in general, we tried to push ourselves in different directions, in different sections of the song. So there's quite a few um, moments where, like, the rug gets pulled out from underneath the song and, like, it suddenly goes from something, you know, one feeling and it just suddenly changes um, and it happens throughout in several songs and I feel like this was kind of 
we could have carried on from a straight feel and gone into something that feels like it makes more sense, but the song definitely has quite a tonal shift from the intro and the verse into this kind of more um, kind of flame and lipsy kind of um, chorus feel that doesn't necessarily match with the like how heavy the intro riff kind of is. And I feel like that was, it was very exciting to get to the end of the song and be like, wow, it's kind of, yeah, it's nothing we've done before. I remember some of the visions we had around that song was like going kind of alternative 90s grunge into like Blur Universal. That, that was kind of what we mm. were aiming for. I'm not sure it like landed there, but um, that's a memory I have from that song. And um, the key part on my Juno um, in, uh, in the studio which is quite weird because we were like, well, that's clearly going to be a, like a brass section. Oh, yeah. And then, and this was the first song that was made for this album and somehow that had brass, which then influenced the rest of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember Murph's, when he started playing the, like, the brass line, it's, it's weird because it's, um, it's a B major, but it's going through a minor like on the, on the actual melody, which, you know, when you look at something, you're like, how does that work? But it just sounds kind of spot on and builds attention and all the rest of it and we did then get like brass players in to play on the studio um but we still used some of that initial kind of midi shitty trumpet sound in oh, line in that yeah because when when we only had the the brass and the sax and stuff it almost sounded like too good like oh it didn't it there was something missing so with mark the producer it was like i think but it sounded so cool before as well like is there a way to and then we just blended like two different things and um so, but it is, it is real stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, it, yeah, as you'll see when we get to some of the other songs that kind of, it didn't make us go, oh, we could, it opens up your, your mind a little bit to how we could bring that flavor back across the rest of the songs. Um, it was a good one to get off the, um, the writing process for the album. It kind of gave us a good um, starting point. I think we'd done like Ready for the High and a couple of others. And then this morning we we started listening to some more kind of ambient lo-fi music, you know, whilst we were drinking a coffee and just like having a chat and stuff. And then I can't remember, like you start playing the piano or something. It'd be like, oh, it would be cool to do something a bit different than we've ever done before. And then I remember you had um, Method to the Madness. You had like that phrase. Methodology. <laughs> the, well, me no, Method to the Madness, that, 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 that phrasing was kind of like a really early point of, a, you know, a sort of starting point of lyrics that Murph had. And I remember then going, oh, that could be cool on the bass. And Todd was like, bum, 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 you know, that follows a sort of similar rhythm to that. And then it felt like we've had piano, a bass thing. And then Todd started like, chopping up audio from his phone that he'd like recorded trees blowing in the wind and gravel on the, you know and started doing this kind of lo-fi um soundscapey thing with like the pedal from the piano and built up all these kind of sounds and it was like oh okay and then we had this sort of starting point um yeah i guess it was like where do we go from here kind of at the end of the song and in the same vein of well let's do songs song structures or changes that we never we've never done before I think that was kind of in our mind throughout the whole process and no idea. Again, it just sort of came and then I suppose we were referencing like Prodigy and Radiohead and um, oh, I don't know what else, but you know, that kind of like kickoff moments at the end of a song when it's just like you just lose your shit and want to like dance and, and then um, you coming in with like the lyrics and you were like, I don't know if this is like, I don't know if this is going to work, but it feels really fucking good. And then he started like singing it and, and we were just like, Oh my, you know, when you get that feeling and you start like, if we feel something like that's bouncing and exciting, then it's usually a, it's a good moment. Yeah, we have this um, food delivery thing in LA. Uh, it's called Methodology. And one of them was sat there. It was full of like joints, basically, full of CBD joints. <laughs> that, um, that old... Slow earthworm. <laughs> earthworm. Slow, slow gym had a few pipes on and um this yeah, so was like method or whatever and then my honeymoon came into the equation and yeah that's where it came from well. 
second trip to LA, wasn't it? Or third? Yeah. I don't know. Um, the Eagle Rock sessions. Yeah, we had got a studio because um, I don't have a drum kit in my studio at home and Dan wanted to play drums, so we hired a studio for, what the hell was that? So we had a studio for a week or two and yeah, People Don't Change is kind of death cabby. Um, War on drugs, kind of americana -y. Yeah. I remember we were like searching for a chorus and then I, li and I listened to like the ghost of Beverly Drive and was just like, maybe we don't need one. We just sing the title over the same hook that we started with, Bob's Your Uncle. Yeah, we, um, st we started jamming and we were literally just like playing and Murph started playing that opening riff and it felt really good. And, and then Todd was just like changing chords underneath and it was like, why do we need to try and ham fist the, you know, a, cor a chorus that suddenly feels very different when that feels so good? Like, um, so the chorus then became the B section um, or the bridge, which yeah. I guess a little bit Harrison guitar mm -hmm. line and um, yeah, it's just really nice to explore something. I don't think we've ever done a song quite like it and it feels like quite a, a standout moment for that reason that doesn't necessarily sound like, I don't think any songs on the album to be honest sound like, oh, well, it sounds like the Wombats. Um, yeah, good driving song. Everything I Love Is Going To Die was written in lockdown in 2020. And I guess, you know, it's supposed to be a happy song. Um, it's quite kind of flock of seagulls, Echo and the Bunnymen inspired somehow, although I wasn't really listening to any of that at the time. The demo of it went really heavy in the bridge and we decided to back off on that and kind of go down more of an acoustic kind of percussion route. So it was pretty rock on the demo. Lots of songs, you know, there were moments in the studio where it was kind of like, just for the sake of having gone in a different direction, where could this go? And so it would be like, let's spend an hour just mocking something up that, you know, takes it into a different world altogether and then see if it brings anything back to the original idea or whether it, if you like it more and then you get more excited by it. And yeah, that section was kind of, let's do something to out the box and got like all tabla and congos and all different like percussion tracks on a keyboard and literally just started like messing around with something totally different. And Mark, the producer, like sort of, yeah, put it all together and was like, this feels pretty cool. And I can't, did you just like, because because we were recording the whole album in separate locations. Um, Murph was over in LA in a studio with an engineer and me and Todd were in London for most of it um, with Mark. We'd often like, Murph would send stuff over to us. Well, when I say Murph, Jonas, but if us two had been left to like organizing the files getting sent back and forth, we'd still be doing the album. Yeah, we'd still be there. Um, but like, we'd get stuff over in the morning and wake up and you know, it, he was in bed and we'd be like, wow, this is awesome. And it would inspire us to do maybe something slightly different because of what Murph had sent over. And like vice versa, I guess it was kind of, well, all we can do is just send it over. And with fresh ears, having not even heard what this direction is, did you get, you probably heard it and went like, okay. Or was it like, oh, this is fun. No, I think, yeah, I remember the change and I was, I liked it. Yeah, because yeah. I got all, all the percussion-y stuff and then we slapped on that acoustic that yeah. seems to be on every song. Yeah. It just sounded great. One thing I remember for that one, which happens a lot with Mark Crew is the um, the endless kind of mind fuckery to kind of get me to sing the chorus as high and as loud as possible. And I was like, oh, come on, I don't, I don't like it when we do that or whatever. And he was like, no, it'll be good, it'll be good. I was like, I'll give you some falsettos and, and a couple of like real blasters. Yeah. He was like, no, just, just blast it, just blast it. I was like, mm. and then he got in Jonas's ear, the engineer, and I had to have the same kind of, um, conversation with him and anyway he got <laughs> he got some high one he got some shouty ones and a lot of falsettos and did what he could Why don't you yeah work is easy life is hard it's kind of got a bit of a manchester swagger Ian Brown kind of vibe. I mean, the guitar part is kind of inspired by you know, something like um, Radiohead, I Might Be Wrong or something like that. 
obviously they wouldn't then crack into well actually no they would crack into breakbeat yeah i love that one and it's kind of the only kind of slightly political song i've ever written really well i've ever written and actually got away with it um it's not a road I, I like to venture down, to be honest, but um, there's a hell of a lot of drums on that track. Uh, the thing, it was the, I think it was the first song that uh, we did because <clears throat> it was with Paul Meany um, and he was in, in America somewhere. Uh, New Orleans, yeah. New Orleans. And I went into Mark's studio at, at night. So it was like obviously his daytime. And, um, and I'd, he, he was amazing, like such good energy, kind of just go for it, like play through the song loads of times, like do whatever you're feeling and and then come back and do different drop-ins here and there and all the rest of it. And it was it was kind of really freeing to to know that like obviously Murph was doing all his bits over in LA, Todd was doing all his bits in Oslo and I just had to like put everything into that and not think about anything else at all and then just kind of go into the other room, do a few BVs and then walk out. And then I honestly don't think I heard it again for like four months or something. <laughs> You know, it's and and then you get it back, and it's like, whoa! He did such an amazing job, like production-wise, on using all the kind of best bits and like hearing it all come together was like, yeah, it was really really cool. Yeah, um, and as a song, it's very, yeah. It apart from the sort of break, the 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 little middle bit when it goes right down, it's very much just in this sort of pa- groove the whole time, and. Um, I don't know, like you almost lose yourself in where you are in the song. You know, it's quite a hypnotic sort of track, which, um, yeah, feels really good. And one of the things I really loved about working with Paul Meany was just like, as Dan said, it seems like hit the way that he works is just you get in a room, record as much as you want, and you just send it to him. And he's like, all right, go away, and I'll send you something back in a month. Yeah. Yeah, so Wildfire was, um, I think that was one of the early writing sessions uh, in Murph's house again. Um, and because, yeah, there was no drum kit in the in, in the studio. Um, a lot of it, I've got all my drums like chopped up, like samples of them. So started, um, it's easy to just get a rough idea together quickly. Um and I feel like that one, there was definitely a kind of talking heads, David Byrne kind of like reference point um, where quite minimal, but rhythmic bass, like simple drums. And then the chorus again kind of took off and went, um, yeah, I, I don't even know, like, is it sort of 90s manchester as well, maybe a little bit or... I don't, I don't know what it is really, to be honest, yeah. but again, similar to People Don't Change People Time does, it was like... Simplicity. It, yeah, it felt really good. So it was like, well, yeah, title of the song, just going over. Um, and then the middle section, I mean... <laughs> well, I was, yeah. <laughs> sounds was like, like Tron. Yeah, the, well, yeah, I, I, they were, we were Did saying, like, well, say what do we do yeah. now? And I was like, what we should just do is just go full Tron for like a minute <laughs> and then go back into it. Um, I just <laughs> yeah. thought... It, Again, simplicity, it was like, that would be fun. Yeah. And but also I, m- I remember thinking like, going, Tron here, like trying to imagine, you know, when someone suggests something that's very like, I mean, if you hear the song up to there, Tron is definitely not what you're thinking about. But it was really fun to actually go like, all right, cool. How can we make Tron fit into this song that's like David Byrne or something mixed with, I don't know. And then, but straight away, once you start doing it, all the arpeggiators and all the rest of it, it feels like really... It makes sense, you know, when something just somehow all the pieces fall into place. And then actually, um, if you listen closely, the arpeggiator stuff that is in that Tron section then um, keeps going through the last chorus, which, again, that worked and like rhythmically and sonically and stuff glues the sections together and sort of makes sense of the whole thing. So it was a happy accident. It was that same Marlboro cigarette box amp oh, yeah. as so, Ready for the High. Yeah, that that actually needs to be focused in on a little bit because Murph's got this little uh, cigarette packet amp and it just, 
it sounds so cool. Um, it's like, yeah, it's on the album quite a bit. Um, and we actually didn't even end up replacing a lot of that stuff that we'd recorded, um, just the three of us in his studio. And, and Mark, the producer, would hear some of them and be like, well, we're not going to record that again, are we? Because that's not, what, what is that? And it's got it's such so a cool. unique... It's like, like $20 and you just plug in and you, you're Jack White, basically. Yeah. So Poke the Bear. Um, yeah, we started with that sort of bouncy swung feel. Um, and again, as we often do, like once you get something that feels really good musically, it's kind of over to you, Bob, and <laughs> like start, you know, Murph will, he'll, will bounce down something, um, the backing track kind of maybe just a verse and a chorus or whatever, and um, a rough idea of where it's going. And then Murph will go off and like go for walks or... Well, yeah, I, I mean, remember we, that yeah. one was kind of stressful because Todd had a cold. Oh yeah. Remember, and my wife was like, you can't be getting a cold off him and passing it on to uh, Dylan um, or me, I'll kill you. Um, and then we were obviously sharing a mic and of course, like I got it and I was just a mess for like a few days. And I remember like walking around Mount Washington, just like sneezing, trying to figure out what the hell was happening with this song. <laughs> And um, the lyrics are pretty weird because I had a cold. <laughs> that was the last song written that made the album. Yeah, it, it's um, we tossed a load of trumpets in that one as well. Oh, yeah, because we've felt like it could could do with it. It's again kind of talking heads, David Burney, I guess. I think the song's probably more about OCD than it is worrying. Um, there's some debates about the spoken word bit that happens. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, that was kind of Jack Knife Lee who produced that one, kind of was really up for it and kind of pushing me into that direction. And I think we pulled it off, but... Um, Time will time will tell. Well, also it's nice working with um, you know when producers like push you maybe a little bit further than what you're comfortable with or or that you think might work or whatever. Like that's that's kind of one of the roles of a producer to slightly make you at least question where your lines are with what you want to do and what you like and what you know. And often those moments can end up being like, oh, I'm so glad we actually did that in the end. Um, and sometimes, obviously, you're like, nah, no chance. And but at least you get you get to explore different um, worlds than you had before. Um, He's obviously like an amazing producer and has been doing it for like 20 years or more now. Mm. I don't know. Um, but I was like, mm, well, first of all, I'm not sure the guys are going to like that. And then I was like, it also it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. And he was like, well, great, that's why, that's why we've got to do it. Um, because if you're feeling uncomfortable, it means you're kind of going somewhere new. Um, and that was something that always kind of stuck with me about that song. I think also like the, yeah, I remember hearing it for the first time and it did make, it do, I think it does make you feel a bit uncomfortable when you hear it because it's so loud and so in your face and like, but it works for the song and what the song's about and stuff like it. Why not feel a little bit uncomfortable in, well, in those moments as well as a listener? Well, it definitely makes us feel uncomfortable. I'm not sure if it, I'm not sure anyone else would give a shit. Maybe not. <laughs> Fix yourself, then the world. That was um, a jam that we had uh, that was. We didn't, you know, we didn't know where it was going to go or what it was going to be, but I think maybe some of that CBD stuff had been <laughs> had been smoked, and um, and then we uh, we were just noodling around and literally had a couple of mics on the piano, a mic over near you, a mic by Todd, and we just started like playing, and we ended up like trying to redo it a little bit. Um, Oh, I spent ages like one day in the studio just like messing around, and uh, Mark was like, "Yeah, go on, add some stuff to that." And then those two heard it and went, yeah, no, we'll just <laughs> we'll just forget all of that and just keep literally what we recorded at the time. Because again, in the sort of the you know the way the Beatles used to work or whatever, it's like, well, it is what it is. We captured something at the time. Let's not overthink it. Just just go with it. And 
until I just turned up the acoustics loads like, uh, and made it sound a bit more Jesus and the Mary chain. And it just felt like we wanted to get it in the album somewhere. And it took us a while to figure out whether it was going to be like an interlude at some point or... Um, but I think it works best as an outro. It's kind of like you get through the whole album and then you just, you know, it's like this sort of um, a truck going down a hill. You know, there's those ramps that go off that slow it down in sand and stuff. Well, that's the sort of, in my mind, anyway, the visual sand um, track. Oh, it's nice to end the album on a kind of more positive note than maybe what has preceded it. It's gone.